Hello everyone and happy World Ocean Day. I have been emceeing the conference for Fair Seas Ireland here at City Hall in Cork and it has been a phenomenal day. But I wanted to share the summary of insights with you, but particularly, can I just show you this, right? This is a summary graphic of every single aspect of what happened today. And the person behind this graphic is called Robin DC, and she, first of all, is absolutely incredible and has given me great help along the way here. For any of you that have seen me MC in the past, you'll know that I love to summarize uh, each element of the conversation and so on. So actually, I didn't realize until I came down to speak to her afterwards, she mentioned that she was benchmarking her summary graphically here against what I was saying. So now I'm actually gonna, gonna do the opposite. So let me take it from the top. First of all, I started off this morning by opening up to say that 97% 97 of life in the world is actually in the ocean. So obviously that's a massive statistic and the challenges related to climate change, etc., are very, very significant. On the other hand, I also looked at this from a business point of view, which isn't always done. And I particularly looked at a study by Euronext and it pointed out that there's a 30% growth in the number of companies in the blue economy that have listed in Euronext since 2015. And it also pointed out that the market cap of companies in the blue economy in Europe is actually equivalent to that of the GDP of Belgium. And also there is 1.4 million people um, employed in the blue economy as well across Europe. So I just wanted to give both sides of that now moving on from there it then what we first of all had a conversation a keynote address from dr rashid and his topic was extremely simple but very powerful in his message and he said that i'm just going to bring it down here so that you can see he pointed out not everything not everywhere and not all at once his point was not everything it means that there needs to be biodiversity justice. His point about not all at once is intergenerational justice and not everything means that we can't be leaving future generations to eat only jellyfish. He also went on, he, he also spoke about an economic concept and that is net uh, present value. And that is that if I do something today, well then the impact of that may decline over time. But he said, if you're actually re-establishing stocks of fish, for example, in a marine protected area, well then, not alone have you turned that around, but the fact that it would be restocked over time means that then the impact of that is dramatically and exponentially higher. So then that led us to the whole conversation around marine protected environments. Now, there isn't a specific definition around it, and there's varying different elements of what a marine protected area is, stretching from um, one side of the spectrum can be a marine protected area means absolutely nothing can be taken out of the sea, there can, can't be any industry that happens on it, all the way over then to what they call a paper park, which is where it's designated, but it's very weakly protected. But the point is, is that at the moment in Ireland, it's, we're currently in a position where uh, up until very recently, 2.1% of, um, of our ocean area was protected. That has now gone up to 8.3%. But the aim is to get this to 30 by 30, which means that 30% of the, uh, Ireland's ocean area would be protected, would be a marine protected area by 2030. Now, if we move on then, and I'm going to take you over here to this panel discussion, right? So this one up here was called Healthy Seas, How Are We Faring? And first of all, Professor Mark Costello started off by telling us that there's a lot of myths around this, like that they're expensive, that they take a remarkable amount of management, and therefore if they do, then it can only be rich environments that have them. And he was telling us a story about Actually, th there can be a lot of um, other er things that can happen as a result. For example, he was telling us the story of an MPA in New Zealand where, number one, the MPA turned into an area of huge uh, tourist attraction because the fish were more plentiful and people were snorkeling and then there was more tourists attracted there. So then the facilities needed to be set up accordingly. And actually, the MPA was a hive of activity as opposed to stopping things. In, I don't know if you can hear that in the background, but they're pulling down the stage. So as always, I'm telling you the breaking news as it's happening. Um, but we are in a live environment. Now, then we had down here, right? So this is uh, Dr. Valerie Hiller, Dr. Valerie Hickey from the World Bank. Fantastic woman, really and truly fantastic woman. And she made so many points. But one of the key things she said is that MPAs are generally speaking taking care of the ocean needs to be funded by more than a public, uh, one public purse. 
she said money needs to come from three areas number one is from domestic budgets number two is from international budgets public budgets and number three is from private finance and she also pointed out as well is that you have to make sure and take care of people who are particularly affected by the decisions that you make whether it's that's the fishing community or whether that is the people who have an industry as a result of the fish that they catch etc all of that really needs to be taken into consideration now then we had dr brian brian mcsharry over here and he shared some statistics with us for example that in the eu 12 percent of the ocean area is marine protected in north america it's 15 percent and in Latin America it's 24% and he also um, shared that we need more data to understand not just the impact that is happening in the oceans at the moment but also what's happening further afield thereafter. Now then over here we had Donald Griffin from, uh, from uh, Fair Seas Ireland and he spoke about the legislation that is drafted and all about what may happen if this, when this comes into law and the considerations around it as well. Now. Moving on from there, I also want to mention that we had two very inspirational messages, one from Dr. Sylvia Earle and another one from Al Gore, talking about the fact that the not alone is there a challenge, but there is a massive opportunity now. And also Al Gore mentioned that there is a lot of political will and that that too is a renewable energy resource and that that is the way it needs to be handled. So then after that, we had uh, another, we had a keynote address over here from Emer Manning. And she spoke about the impact of climate justice. So she was talking about when we look at climate change, it's important to really think about the impact of those that would be affected by changes as a result. Now, that's not the typical way of looking at it, right? Ordinarily, we think about who's going to be affected by climate change, the climate itself. But she is also saying if we were to completely change industries around, it's people at potentially the bottom end of the food chain that could be affected by that. And that's what climate justice is. It's thinking about everybody. But she also spoke about the importance of bringing young people into to the conversation now any of you that know me you know how much i agree with that given how many teenagers we work with but she was particularly saying that uh, young people under 30 years old make up a third of the global population they're endlessly innovative and they're driven to act in a meaningful way now from there then we went on to talk about delivering transformational change for better mpa outcomes now i'm just going to show you here like look at the detail here that has been applied to this on the part of robin like she's just unbelievable in fairness to her she's just amazing if i could summarize this the key points here is that there's lots of international best practice for a start number two is that mpas do lead to greater fishing stocks and therefore, the, the, what the fishermen and fisher people, what the fisher community are looking for and what they may be afraid of needs to be listened to in the context of what has happened in different places around the world. So, for example, in, uh, in an MPA in uh, outside Hawaii, yellowfin tuna has increased by 54% and there's six times more fish in protected areas. Um, also, as well, they, they constantly, 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 there was the focus that when you're introducing MPA, it's so important to bring people with you talk to the local people get listen to the local stakeholders get them on board don't tell them what's going to happen involve them in the decisions and in the conversations that are going to happen along the way communicate communicate in a language that other people can understand be excited and be hungry to hear their points of view and point out that there can be really good outcomes as a result of this now then what we also had was we had this panel over here which was harnessing stakeholder involvement for better MPA outcomes. Now, this was a different type of panel discussion. So we had people from industry, we had people from the bird watching community, we had people from, um, oh, I'm going to pop over here now, actually, I'm going to, we also had from the Cork Environmental Forum with Bernadette Connolly, we have Niall McManus from the marine renewable sector, we had Kieran Healy from the fish sector, then we also had Niall McAllister from marine tourism. So looking at five different stakeholders and their concerns and their worries, but also what do they want when it comes to when it comes to stakeholder engagement what holds them back and I want I, as again you know I will ask the questions that I feel are really important like who's not being listened to what stakeholder is not in the room what is there a source is there a root of distrust is there something that can be done to accelerate or catalyze the conversation and so the, we and we, we spoke about all of those areas again it was about number one people need to be brought to the table social costs need to be borne by the appropriate partners 
people need to be listened to, actions need to be followed up on, but particularly as well, there is a big concern, of course, that this is an issue that needs attention and very, very quickly. And so we finish up here with uh, Dr. Michal O'Kaneja, who finished off by telling us that there are four key outcomes that need to result from today, is we need to learn, legislate, measure and protect. Thank you so much to Aoife, to Jack, to Donal and to Alana for inviting me to MC this conference here at City Hall in Cork. It's been a super experience to work with you and such an important conversation.